Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started as people start rolling in. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Thanks for joining us today for WCET's Flipped Webcast Conversation. Looks like we have a hand raise. If you have any questions, go ahead and enter them into the question box, and I'll also be following the chat and Twitter. The Twitter hashtag is hashtag WCET Webcast, so I'll be trying to keep my eye on that as well. But this is a very informal conversation. Chris is going to go ahead and start with a, just a few, live, a few slides to set the context. And hopefully you did your homework and viewed the presentation ahead of time, because this is supposed to be very open and just um, more of a conversation than a presentation. So again, my name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Director of Programs here at WCET. And we have a wonderful guest with us today. And he was our keynote sp speaker at the WCET annual meeting in October in Portland last year, and we were thrilled to have him, but we had so much wonderful content and we cut him a little short on his time, so we didn't have as much time to get into dialogue and discussion, so we're thrilled that he came back to join us here in January, and we're thrilled you're, you're all here. So with that, I'll go ahead and introduce Chris briefly and let him tell you a little more about himself and his interest in digital redlining. Chris Hilliard is a professor of English at Metcom Community College in Michigan. His work concentrates on privacy, institutional tech policy, digital redlining, and the reinventions of discriminatory practices through data mining and algorithmic decision making, especially as these apply to college students. He's currently developing a project that looks at how popular misunderstandings of mathematical concepts create illusions of fairness and objectivity in student analytics, predictive policing, and hiring practices. Go ahead and take it away, Chris. Oh, hi. Okay. Well, thanks for that. Um, and uh, yeah, so I just, um, I guess, wanted to give a brief um, recap of, of what I talk about a lot and, and, um, and why I talk about it in that, in that fashion. Um, so uh, if uh, I think people can see the slide. So, um, but yeah, when I think about digital redlining, so the, the definition I've come up with, and certainly it's not the only one um, other people talk about it some somewhat differently but is enforcing class boundaries and or discriminating against specific groups through tech policy practice pedagogy or investment decisions um, and I, I'm really interested especially uh, in how that plays out in classrooms um, I, and I, I teach at a community college and so I've been very uh, it's been very illuminating to see how um, the, those decisions play out differently amongst different populations. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of an issue that often goes um, sometimes unexamined and, and often, but often uh, less examined than it should be. Um, and uh, so Megan, if you could do the uh, slide or page eight. Um, and so the, the way I came about thinking about this is, um, and I, I mentioned this in the talk that, that people watched, I think, um, but uh, is, uh, it's the, the, the definition of redlining one, I'm sorry, maybe it's not page eight for you, um, is uh, I live, um, I grew up in Detroit um, and I live right outside of Detroit now, but, um, and this is probably true for a lot of areas where other people live. If, if uh, you look at, there's a website called Mapping Inequality, where you can look at old um, HOLC maps for, uh, I think, something like 70 major cities in the, in the country. Um, and you can really see, even now, right, like um, the divisions, how the divisions um, that were laid out back then uh, play out in, in, in what a city looks like now. Um, and living in, uh, growing up in Detroit, like that's very obvious. Um, and so a lot of those divisions have become replicated in the digital world. Um, and I found it's a very useful metaphor to help people kind of uh, visualize um, what inequality looks like uh, in a way that I think other frameworks um, haven't been as useful. Um, so that's, that's why I do what I, that's why I, I talk about the way I do. Um, I found it's kind of the most uh, compelling, if, for lack of a better word.
Okay. Let me know what slide you want me to stop on here. Okay. Um, it was, so it's, it's an early one. It's like, um, uh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. It is. So let me pull up this. So we're on the same, we're on the same, uh, So I have it as page uh, eight. There we go. Okay. Am I in the right place there, Chris? Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. So, um, I mean, really, I guess, uh, I mean, if there are questions, I mean, I could talk about more, but I'd uh, be way more interested in kind of having a dialogue or um, answering questions or. Um, sure, well, I'll start. There's no questions in the question box yet, but how did you start to come working on this? What so, um, what happened is, uh, excuse me, so, um, what happened is uh, I, uh, my, my um, college had a, a, a policy of, of filtering the internet. Um, and I was, uh, my students were doing a lot of work. Uh, well, so a little bit of background. So um, if people aren't aware of how filters work, they tend to um, let in things that people don't necessarily want let in, but they keep out a lot of things that people might want to. Um, they keep out things that people um, like might legitimately want to see. So like if um, things from the Bible might be kept out uh, through a filter or certain poetry or literature, um, lots of works of art, right? Um, we have a nursing program in my school, um, so anatomy things. Um, so my students, there's a lot of work my students couldn't do on campus um, because uh, they would be blocked from viewing certain kinds of material, like even people's blogs, you know, um, things like that. Um, and we do a lot of work in the classroom. And so it was like, uh, and even sort of spontaneously, if you wanted to pull up a website or a video or anything like that and show it to students, um, a lot of times you would try to do that and it wouldn't, um, that you'd be blocked. Um, and so uh, people who are instructors could imagine um, uh, like how that wouldn't work out too well. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, because so many of my students, uh, you know, either maybe didn't have internet at home or um, didn't have the right kind of internet at home, didn't have broadband. I mean, I, I had students who still have dial up. Um, and, uh, you know, or I have students who, you know, many of whom, like, they're on campus, say, two days a week, and they do all their work when they're on campus, uh, and they have jobs and kids and other responsibilities. And so having, um, having a filtered internet was really hampering their ability to do their work. Um, and so I started to look into it more deeply. Um, and, and again, one of the unfortunate things is that so many people don't know, um, don't have a, a strong understanding of uh, how the internet works. Uh, and our, the, the powers that be at our campus are also not doing people any favors because the, the, the landing page when something was blocked would just tell people that it, either it violated the, the terms of service or there was a virus on a particular page. Um, and so people would often be blocked and not know why. Um, and so that kind of set me on the road, um, and two of my colleagues and I, uh, that kind of set us on the road of starting to, um, look at some of this, um, how this works and, and fight against that policy at our own institution. Um, there's an interesting comment from Mark Lentini, and I'm not sure, Mark, what institution are you from? If you could just type that into the chat box. He says, we fought really hard to not have filtered internet in the late 90s, so we don't. But many of the other pieces of this talk 
uh, he does experience with his students and he's a Highline College outside of Seattle, Washington. So I think, you know, there, there was quite a groundswell there in the late 90s, but I think um, several policies were in place before they were really uh, needed necessarily. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's somewhat atypical at a college um, to have a filtered internet. Uh, I mean, it does exist, um, but it, it's somewhat atypical. I mean, in, in K through 12 institutions, um, it's mandated federally that they have some type of filter. Um, but uh, I, I mean, and I, I'm aware of some of the uh, arguments for why uh, there might be filters on a college campus, but I'm a strong advocate that for material that's legal, um, mm -hmm. I mean, college students should be able to access it. And, and I mean, again, part of that is like, they don't work the way people want them to work. And they're also, um, college, most college students, and for that matter, most K through 12 students um, with, uh, with a significant amount of will can, uh, can bypass them. Sure. Other questions? I'll ask you another one. And uh, give us a little more context in terms of your students and how, um, how they feel when they realize that some of this is being withheld and it's in hindering their access, or you know, they have to come to you and say, um, this is something I really wanted to look at, but for some reason I feel like it's a violation and it shouldn't be. Well, I mean, so there's a lot in there actually. Um, I mean, again, one of the, so the way that our institution had it set up, it wouldn't just say like, you're being blocked because, you know, we don't think you should access this material. Um, but, you know, it really would slow down class, uh, class activities um, or really cause a lot of frustration. I mean, um, one of the, I think, ideal ways in which education takes place is through exploring, right? So there are times that things come up in class or students have ideas or you think, oh, well, this would be a great example, um, or if students are doing research, um, we don't necessarily know where it's going to lead them on a given day or during a, diff or a given exercise, but often it would just be like running into a wall, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it, it's a pretty terrible thing to have a student who's excited about doing something and says, hey, you know, I really wanna look at this, and then they're on the you know um, machine at school, and like it tells them like they can't look at it. You know, so for instance, I had a student um, who on his own came up with this topic. He, I mean, he was he wanted to look at um, something about like uh, the uh, uh, Kylie Jenner and cultural appropriation. Um, and there had been a, a really outspoken actress who got a blog um, who uh, had had um, written on that but it was a Tumblr blog. And so our campus had just like, um, like uh, just blocked Tumblr across the board, right? Even though this particular blog, we didn't have any, you know, um, objectionable content or whatever. Um, and so, it, I mean, he was really excited about that, but like couldn't do the thing that he wanted to do because the, the college was um, preventing him from doing that. And this ties in to me a lot with the idea, um, a lot, I mean, I still see this fairly often, right? Which is the idea that students don't care about a lot of these issues, whether it's something like redlining or even, um, you know, digital redlining or even things like privacy. Um, and I mean, uh, two things on that. I mean, my own experience, but also lots of um, research, uh, whether you look at, um, work done by people like Dana Boyd or whether you look at surveys done by Pew or things like that um, is that people young people do care a lot about this stuff um, part of it is a, a feeling of um, um, lack of agency uh, but I mean from my perspective um, uh, a lot of it also is that I think we need to do a better job in classrooms of modeling the kinds of behaviors um, or attitudes we want um, students to, to think about and consider. I'm glad you brought that up. I actually had a planning conversation yesterday for a webcast that we're doing in Feb 
yeah, in February, which is right around the corner, about students' perception and privacy and data usage. And the student that we're having on, I don't, I don't want to let too much out of the bag in case you're registered for that webcast and you're going to join us in February, but she's so smart and um, she is so familiar with higher ed, but has kind of been through the swirl of numerous different institutions. And she said, you know, I really, really do care and my peers care, but we want to have a say in what data is used and how it's used because she could be classified one way just based on some of her demographic information, but really her story would be very, very different. And she um, just really drove home the point that data has so many really positive implications in terms of um, some early indicators, early uh, sort of interventions that will help um, students get through those early gateway courses. But she just thinks that there needs to be more information out there on how the data is being used and accessed and have students have a voice at the table. Is that your experience at your community? Yeah, yeah, this is so important. Um, I mean, because I think, again, one of, the, one of the difficulties with so much of this technology um, is that it deprives people of framing their own narrative. Um, so a lot of uh, information um, about people is, uh, is uh, it's inferred, right? Um, so data is extracted and um, narratives about people are inferred um, and often without the person ever getting the ability to, to um, exactly. in any way um, act on that, right? Uh, and I think that's actually a, a, a that's a, a really um, brilliant comment by your student. And I, I, I found that that's one of the ways um, if you think students aren't interested or if you're introducing a topic to students, I found that that's one of the ways that's a, a, a productive inroad is to ask them about like how important it is to frame their own narratives about who they are and what they want and how they want to be seen and you know who gets to know what about them. Um, I mean, these are things that most people care about. I mean, most um, young people care about. Mm -hmm. um, and when you frame it in that fashion, uh, I, I found the results are, are a lot um, more productive. Great. Well, we have questions rolling in, so I'm going to back up here and I will ask you our first question from Melanie McKay. Have you looked at how this plays out in terms of internet quality? Is there a correlation between the ethnicity of certain geographies and those and the speed of internet available in those areas? That's a great question. I think this map will. Yeah, speak. absolutely. Um, if you look at, I mean, so it tends to be, I mean, there, there's two ways in which that works. Um, you know, inner cities. So inner city Cleveland, Detroit, um, you know, are amongst the worst um, of the worst uh, uh, degree of uh, broadband access. Uh, I mean, New York um, in, uh, in the country. Uh, and, and, and flatly, I mean, frankly, that's because um, the way that the regulations are set up is one that a lot of companies don't have incentive to improve the services. So uh, like our ISP our service provider is Comcast. Um, I mean, and there's only a couple in the, in the country, um, but a lot of them don't have incentive to build in um, inner cities because they don't think that they're going to, um, they don't think that they'll be rewarded financially for that. Right. That there's not, people aren't going to be able to afford the higher quality mm -hmm. services. The other thing is that um, uh, uh, telecoms have um, and I, ISPs have uh, lobbied the government such that in many um, cities and many municipalities, it's actually illegal for people to form their own, um, for a municipality to offer their own broadband that would be in competition with the ISP. And so there's this, this uh, structure set up that where companies don't want to invest but um, municipalities are prevented from investing at the same time. Um, I mean, the, and the way that plays out in rural areas is not exactly the same, um, you know, uh, because, I mean, it's, it's the same in terms of investment decisions, um, but the, what that population looks like um, demographically tends to be a little different. Um, 
So my students, uh, you know, by and large are, are white, but uh, my college is a community college, but it's a close to, it's closer to rural, rural than, than urban, you know, for like, I, I mean, those terms are, have some issues, but I think people get the meaning. Great. Here's a, another related question. I, this is from Mark Lentini. I watched the Oklahoma presentation and he closed with the idea of foregrounding consent in conversations. Could you please talk a bit more about that consent as part of tech implementation? policy decisions, conversations with students, or all of the above? Yeah, so, um, I mean, just to go back to what you were saying, Megan, I mean, uh, uh, when we think about um, student uh, data analytics and predictive analytics and things like that, like, um, a lot of times students aren't asked, you know, right? Or either mm -hmm. it's their sort of default opt-in. Um, so let me, let me go back a little bit and, I'm gonna to try to give a concise answer to a thing that I could, that probably I could talk about for the next 40 minutes. So um, part of the problem is that uh, the, the model we have for the web right now, right? Or the model that we have for so many technologies is that information is taken from us, like whether we want to or not, like whether, whether you, you know, whether you use Facebook or not, they still take data on you. You know, there's data brokers like Axcom and Experian you know, that sell data about you, right? There's license plate readers everywhere. I mean, you know, if you leave your Bluetooth on or your Wi-Fi on when you walk around, like um, there's ways for companies to either geo-target you or take information from, from your phone. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for kind of why we are where we are, but that's sort of the model that we have right now. Um, and it has a host of problems. Um, and I think when we replicate that in our classrooms, um, I think we're doing our students a real disservice. Um, but the, but here's the other thing. So one, one other thing that complicates this is that the structure of how things work now is that, um, as data is, is taken from us, um, and kept and stored, for, you know, indefinitely. There's so many ways are constantly being, new ways are constantly being invented on how to use that. And so even um, a company like Facebook, um, or even, a, I mean, colleges and universities, right? They can't um, realistically tell you all the things that they might do with your data because they don't know yet. Um, and so consent or control of data, uh, consent is almost, um, in, in that regard, um, we actually kind of need to move beyond consent because if they're taking data from people and they don't know how they're going to use it in the future, it's impossible for someone to have any real informed consent. Um, mm -hmm. So in some ways, like the whole model is busted. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, that sounds... Um, I'm sure like uh, dystopian and, um, you know, uh, and it kind of is, <laughs> but like, I, I mean, I, I think there are some ways out, but um, we don't have, we're not practicing them right now. Yeah, I have, I have several questions I want to ask, but I'm going to get back to some of these attendee questions. This is from Melanie. Are there companies doing better than Google and Amazon? and not allowing advertisers to discriminate in choosing their clientele, what recommendations would you make to a platform that wants to avoid facilitating or even generating digital redlining? Who? Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so I would refer back to my, what I was just saying in that, so the, um, because, uh, so ad targeting as a means of, um, as a means of, of powering uh, technology is hugely problematic. Um, and I think, um, you know, uh, Google, I mean, Google and, and, and um, Amazon, oh gosh, I don't even know where to start with that question mm -hmm. of Google and Amazon. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've made some small changes and improvements. Um, but again, part of the, um, the difficulty is that um, 
uh, I want to say this in the right way. So America, by and large, operates um, in terms of technology uh, from the perspective that uh, too many laws or you know preemptive laws are, are hamper innovation. Um, and the problem with that is that um, so many things get done uh, that are harmful um, and then we're kind of stuck uh, trying to um, reduce or repair those harms. Um, and so uh, I think they're doing better, um, but I mean, I think targeted advertising and the extraction of people's data, um, I think those things in themselves, I think are, are um, they are actually, I mean, I'll be, I'll be explicit. Like, I don't think they should exist. Um, not in the ways that they do. Um, because uh, there is no meaningful way to not participate in that, right? Um, even if I didn't have a phone, like, even, like, it, unless you, like, you lived off the grid in a, in a manner that, you know, most of us wouldn't even be able to do our jobs, you are a participant in it. In, 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 in this uh, economy and that digital economy or that tech economy in ways that um, you don't have, you have very limited control over. Mm -hmm. uh, and frankly, I mean, we could talk about facial recognition too. I mean, frankly, like a lot of that stuff should be illegal um, or at least the, in the ways that it exists right now because it's extracting um, um, information from people. Um, and we often call it consent, right? But the consent is like, I bought a phone, right? Or I clicked on a button, right? Um, it's not real consent. I would agree. And I'm finding it to be more and more intrusive. And there's numerous examples of sending an email and then all of a sudden that product reference is showing up in my Instagram feed. And I actually had a conversation with someone that is very familiar with um, some of the Google um, uh, uh, cloud security and I said you used to be able to go into Google and there was somewhere where you could click on your profile and see exactly what it had pegged you as and when the last time I looked it was a mid-30s male so I was I felt a little uh, vindicated that they had it very very wrong and so I went back to look and that's totally gone but you can change some of your ads yeah. in there but it's only saying yeah instead of this I would like to see this but it's very, <laughs> very much in your face now. More so, it was a little more subtle. Now it's very intrusive. Yeah. Let me get to some more of these questions. This is a, this is a really great thought. So this is from Liz Boltz. Reflecting on the history of power dynamics and information, who decides what information is appropriate and who, whom to access it? it? Makes me think about the algorithms that define what gets filtered out, both where and who they come from and what the consequences are. And I came across an article from MIT today about how AI is actually being used to predict guilty pleas with criminal cases based on historic data. Mm -hmm. It was really unsettling. Yeah, yeah. ProPublica did some really great work with that. And I mean, uh, I mean, we're moving full speed ahead on a lot of these things. And, you know, some of them, uh, you know, I think, individually we, we're gonna have very limited means to affect them um and so one of the things i keep i always try to come back to is like what we do in our classrooms um mm -hmm. because again part of the reason um students exist the way they do is that for most of them like the way that things work right now is the only way that they have known it to be um and so i think it's it's really important to um, posit that other ways are possible and, you know, encourage them to think that as well, right? Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, Emily Jacobson says, I'd be interested to hear, this is where we turn it positive, I'd be interested to hear thoughts from Dr. Gilliard on what some potential solutions are for decreasing digital redlining. So, uh, I mean, a couple things, uh, you know, I'm, this is like, kind of in the weeds for a lot of people, but uh, I think it is useful, and I've, I've found it very useful to look at your college's um, 
um, acceptable use policy um, because that is it's a it's a often you know not looked at until there's a problem um, but I've, I've looked at probably a couple hundred um, from institutions across the, the country and you can really see sort of what the attitude is about students and and innovation and access to information um, and again i think uh in our classroom practices right like uh, one of one of the things i suggest is if you give assignments or if you um if students are supposed to do anything with technology i mean well there, there's two suggestions i have um one is that you uh, get some sense like you could do like an anonymous survey of what kinds of access people do have. Um, you know, do they do? The, do they write their papers on their phones? Like, do they have broadband at home? Um, do they share data plans with a, you know other members of the family? Like things like that. Like um, to find out what kinds of access they have. Um, and again, I would if if I'm designing it, I would prefer it be anonymous. Um, and the other thing is, uh, and I've gotten in trouble for saying this. I, mean, I shouldn't say I've gotten in trouble, but I've gotten a lot of pushback for saying this. But um, I uh, inherently reject uh, the idea that we should, um, I, I'm very suspicious of having students do um, work that puts them on things like Facebook and Twitter. Uh, or um, or Instagram or things like that, um, and I understand that in some cases this may be necessary depending on the class. Um, but it, a lot of times, um, if 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 you're going to have those kinds of assignments, what I strongly suggest is making uh, um, options available for people who don't want to um, do that for a couple different reasons, right? For surveillance and privacy reasons, for marginalized populations and vulnerable populations. I mean, being just being on Facebook or being on um, Twitter or being online, right? It means different things for different people. Um, and it's important to consider that when we're designing assignments and um, putting students in groups and, and, and things like that. Um, asking them to watch movies like or download something when they're not on campus um, so just to just to be more um, be more conscious about how we do those things that we take for granted right I mean I'm this may not be a fair assumption but probably most of the people who are hearing this have pretty good access right and have like a phone that works and a, like a pretty um, you know uh, extensive data plan and like uh, all those things and it's not fair to assume that everyone in our classrooms is going to have that same mm -hmm. kind of access right and speaking of students and access it, it, so often we explain that they're creating this online profile that's going to go with them for ever and i have a six-year-old so thankfully he doesn't have any sort of access so far and i'm hoping that that pendulum swings and it's so passe by the time he's there. But for those that are in, in our institutions, how do you advise that we coach them along on curating their, their online presence so that it is uh, something that is gonna be professional, but also is clearly somewhere where they're gonna interact with their peers? Hmm, I'm, well, I'm not, maybe I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, you know, I think there's this tendency to put everything out there on, on the internet. Oh, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry, go ahead. We need to curate that content and help them understand the importance of that. So how do you help drive that point home when everything is so in the moment and so, I, this just happened, I have to put it out on every single social media that's out there but really help them understand what some of those implications are. Yeah, I mean, in my, in my experience, I mean, students, I mean, at least by the time they get to college, um, but also high school students are pretty savvy about that. Um, you know, so um, lots, of, so like, um, 
students like they're one of the um bigger or more prominently used platforms for uh, young folks is instagram mm -hmm. right but like students tend to have like several different um that that age group tends to have like several different instagram accounts right and they even have like a different language for how to talk about them like um there's an interesting um the berkman center at harvard did like an interesting kind of round table with a bunch of students um where i learned the term uh, finsta right which i didn't know about right but, or i had i had known about it but i understood it to be like a fake instagram account right um <laughs> so um so students are already pretty aware of like the multifaceted ways in which they um, are able to to construct their identities i mean right like they um if they spend time online i mean they see like influencers right and they they experience these different uh, ways in which people are constructing their identities um where they tend to need um a little bit more guidance is in how to construct the professional one um but the the idea of that there would be different ones is not foreign to them yeah that's that's completely new to me so but then again when i was on a college campus working in housing it, people didn't even have cell phones so it was very very different yeah we are I'm not seeing any more questions come in. There was a question. It looked like the mapping inequality project. Is that mm -hmm. at richmond.edu? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that link is correct. I'll copy this over and put it in the chat if I can. So other questions, comments. Do you want to take us through some of these other slides since we have time? Um, oh, I can. Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, I mean, we talk, I, you know, I talked in the, the well, I, you know, I guess, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on even now with some of the information coming out about Facebook, um, you know, and about, um, if, so uh, if we can go to um, 21, um, you know, like Zuckerberg just had a, a uh, editorial in the Wall Street Journal talking about data. Um, I'm getting there. And, you know, so there's a ton of interesting work um, as like sort of the backlash comes against uh, some of the, uh, I think, abusive practices that these companies are doing. Um, and I just want to elaborate on something that's really helped me on a couple things that's really helped me kind of think about um, look at different ways of how to think about some of this stuff. And I have just now learned how to properly pronounce uh, this guy's name, which I'm very embarrassed about, but it's actually um, Sir Neck. Yeah, um, so he wrote a, a book called Platform Capitalism, um, which I would recommend to anybody who's watching this or listening to this. Um, real short book, like you could read it in one sitting. But it talks about sort of um, how we came to understand some of these companies, you know, whether it be Uber or Amazon or um, Facebook um, or, you know, for, for some of our purposes, like the learning management system, right, as platforms and, and kind of what that means in terms of um, how to uh, um, how to uh, how to view them, right? And that an important uh, aspect of that, right, is that every platform, um, by its design, um, embodies a politics, right? That there are things that you can and can't do. That there are ways of being on there. Um, and th this is also a fun kind of thing to do with students, is to talk about what the what the um, what the politics of a particular platform is or what the ways of being are, what the, the written and unwritten rules um, for being on, on that particular um, service are. But that, um, that notion that they embody a politics is really important for thinking about, you know, kind of why we are where we are um, and where else we might be or how else we might be. 
Um, and even, again, I think the learning and management system is, uh, is a way of thinking about that, right? Because like, um, they are also, um, there's, um, you can conduct some pretty detailed surveillance of students by a learning management system, uh, through a learning management system, um, which is something, again, I'm super uncomfortable with. Uh, and you can throw in like eBooks and things like that when, you're, when you start to track like how long someone's been reading something or how long they are on a certain page and, and things like that. Um, so I've, I've found that um, book to be really useful. And then um, if you go to, uh, to uh, 19, Megan, um, so uh, Shoshana Zuboff just came out with her book, like actually I think it just came out this past week called Surveillance Capitalism, um, which again takes like a, kind of a long, uh, broad overview of where we are in terms of um, how like the dominant mode of how technologies, um, like digital technologies work, right? Primarily by um, sucking up people's data and, and, and moving on from there. Um, so I think those are two um, really, and, and so in part of the reason I, I recommend those is that um, unfortunately, I think a lot of ed education technology looks to uh, the, those other sectors, right? Um, to see kind of what's, what kinds of things should be done, right? So, um, when I see something like uh, people wanting to use facial recognition and sentiment analysis in classrooms, right? So the idea that you would have a camera, so I, if, if anybody's listening and follows me on Twitter knows that I spend a lot of time kind of um, making fun of um, different uh, educational technologies. And there was just an article in EdSearch the other day where, um, this guy has a, I forget what it's called, Education 240 or something like that. Um, but the, the, the uh, innovation is to put cameras everywhere in a classroom um, and then and record every single in, um, interaction, um, transcribe that so that students can go back. Um, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, so that students, uh, ostensibly so that students can go back and, and look at the lecture and, and or that uh, professors and instructors can go back and see moments where um, see when learning was happening and things like that. Mm -hmm. and other people have added things like facial or uh, sentiment analysis to this. So supposedly then you could tell when students were confused um, mm -hmm. and when they were angry and when they were having insights and stuff like that. Um, I think that uh, one of the unfortunate things about education technology right now is the ways in which we look at um, uh, we look to things like um, Facebook or we look to things like um, facial recognition or we look to things like Amazon you know or uber I mean a number of times have you heard someone say like Uber but for education or, or like um, Facebook but for education um, most of those things are built on some pretty unjust models. Uh, you know, I mean, Amazon, Uber, Facebook, um, they're built on pretty unjust models. So, um, you know, and as certain extent, right, they embody a politics, right? And so when we import that model into education, um, we're bringing, uh, I, I mean, almost uh, necessarily uh, we're bringing like that aspect of injustice to it. Um, and so I, I really, um, what I, I try to encourage people to do is think about like um, what the politics are of a particular technology and what it means to like, just try to um, transfer it over to education. Um, in most cases, like it doesn't say very good things. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Here's another question that we had come in from Elizabeth Schofield. Your talk touched on the idea that free web-based services rely on using their users' data as their product. If we avoid using these systems in our learning environments, 
it seems likely that we'll need to learn to pay for tools that respect our privacy. So there's always that trade-off, right? The more security and privacy, the higher the cost. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on how we deal with the financial inequities that these might pose based on which individuals and institutions can afford access to those tools? That is a fantastic question. Um, and, you know, um, unfortunately right now there's not a great answer. Uh, or I don't have one. And, and, and so let me give you some background on that. So um, one of the things, for instance, say that Zuckerberg will say, and has, has said often, right, is that um, Facebook has to be free so everyone can use it, right? And this is like, on its, on its surface, it's like a really compelling argument, right? So that, um, and so, it be, and, and part of that is true, right? If like, you just start charging for Facebook, right, there would be people who couldn't use it and their lives might be materially affected. But I, I'm gonna go like a step back further than that in that um, uh, uh, to, to what I said um, a little bit earlier, like some of the, some of the practices that these um, companies perform like should not be legal. Um, and so, uh, I mean, they are, a lot of these services, um, I mean, they, they are useful in a lot of different ways, right? So people, um, so I, one of the things I say, all that, I don't use Facebook, um, and I haven't for several years. Um, but I, for many people, that's a luxury. If you have a small business, um, if you have relatives um, in a different city or outside the country, even, um, there are a lot of reasons that you um, you might not be able to not just simply not use the service. Um, but also for students. And I will interject here though, that there are lots of open source um, tools uh, that students can use that are free, um, that don't necessarily operate on that extractive model. Um, but it, while it is true that um, some of the things that we, some of the ways that we have students operate now, um, we do because they're free. Um, but they're, they're built on models of, um, they're built on unjust models that, by the way, are also, again, like um, disproportionately affecting um, marginalized uh, populations in different ways. So uh, let, me, let me give it, so an, an example I often use, right, is, the, um, is Facebook uh, um, doing what uh, ethnic affinity so i talked about that in, in the talk right um where people could say like i don't want a, a particular group to see this kind of advertising mm -hmm. um and where for things like housing and things like that jobs I mean, that's really problematic and so i think we have to um be pretty um aware of what kinds of trade-offs we're offering when we um, say to people, like, I want you to use this technology. And so I can't say across the board, you know, I, I mean, I know what I do in my classrooms, right? And I look for alternatives and I would urge people to do that. I can't say across the board, like never have students use these things. But I, I'd say like, be really conscious about what as much as we can be about what we're asking them to do, um, what they're giving up and what we're getting in return and what kind of alternatives might be available. Um, so again, I, most of my reservation is that um, I see so many practices where that's not the case, um, where these things kind of aren't thought out because they're not free, right? They, they are not free. And also, um, that kind of, uh, you know, what we're giving up, right, um, means different things to different people. Um, and so while they are, um, they appear to be free for, uh, um, particularly for, for populations who, um, 
uh, might not be able to afford a different, like a non-free option, those populations are also the ones who are often most harmed by being on them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if that makes sense. And so there's a lot more um, harassment and targeting of black women on Twitter than any other group, like by far. And so Twitter is free, right? Okay, but like, um, if you a are asking a black woman to be on Twitter, you are, there's something else there to consider, right, in terms of like what the cost is. Um, and so what, and so while we're working towards um, uh, technologies that aren't, um, that aren't free to extract information, right, but also um, that uh, do better jobs at targeted harassment, and digital redlining and things like that, um, we have to balance those things out. Because um, I mean, those technologies aren't free, right? There's always, there's a cost mm -hmm. that is disproportionately um, born um, by marginalized folks um, and populations. And so, it, you know, it's a calculation we always have to, to weigh. Along those same lines, it makes me think of proctoring and authentication software. You know, they're, the promise of the internet is that people can take classes anywhere and be anywhere, but with that comes the need for authentication, but there's some implications there too. Right, right, absolutely. So we don't have any other questions or comments. And do you want to touch on any other slides? Um, Give people another chance to ask questions. Final call. I mean, if we could go to that last one. Um, and or uh, the um, Weizenbaum quote. Is that 31? Uh, 31, yeah. Here we go. Um, so if people aren't familiar with him, he's a, a very um, kind of compelling uh, figure. And was one of the people who are, um, is kind of credited with laying a lot of the groundwork for artificial intelligence. Um, but I also uh, was very much a, uh, you know, very conscious critic of, of a lot of um, this work, right? And I, I feel so often, right, like um, in terms of discussions about privacy, I mean, I, what I call them are privacy nihilists, right? We're like, privacy is dead and privacy doesn't exist and nobody cares about privacy. Um, and when I hear that, right, I, I mean, I don't believe it. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's under siege. I think it's being attacked. Um, but uh and undermined but i i, I think that um talking about a lot of this technology as an inevitable um puts us in a mindset of of um accepting things that don't have to be mm -hmm. um you know most of uh a lot of this stuff is i mean certainly there have always been um ways of marginalizing people and discrimination um Certainly there's always been surveillance networks, like all of these things. But a lot of the things that we talk about right now as inevitable, you know, tech in terms of technology has not, I mean, I have t-shirts older than a lot of this stuff. Um, and so I think it's always, I mean, I think it's imperative that we um, always think about the ways in which, um, you know, we have some responsibility um, some agency, um, you know, both individually and and um, a, as groups, right? So um, a lot of times when I tell people, I, well, I don't use this technology or I don't do this with my students or whatever the case may be, you know, I don't use Amazon, right? I mean, I might use Amazon. Uh, it's my, it's a last resort, right? I, I might use it two or three times a year. Um, so I'm not actually hurting Jeff Bezos, right? I'm nor Amazon's bottom line. Um, but one of the, um, a, a way I encourage people to think about it sometimes is environmentalism. Um, so whether or not I, uh, recycle, um, doesn't affect, um, you know, so I don't own like the pipeline that runs underneath the Great Lakes. Okay. And I, and, and so whether or not I recycle, like it doesn't like it doesn't like magically 
like cure um, the problems that we have in terms of pollution, right? Because individuals aren't like the biggest um, polluters. Um, but I think in the, our individual actions, uh, in our, our, and when we're conscientious about what we're doing and why we're doing it, and again, I just reiterate, like we set that mode in our classrooms and most of us have some agency in that regard, but our individual actions in regards to how we use tech and when we use it, when we don't use it, uh, I think has the ability to build some um, more uh, uh, organized um, um, movements that might put us, help um, move us in a, in a better direction than we are now. Um, so none of this stuff is inevitable. I mean, most of it has not been around that long. Um, and so I think that's important to always consider. Absolutely. Well, I think that's a great place to end. I think that's a powerful quote and uh, gives us a lot to think about as we head into the weekend and then return back to our institutions. So any final thoughts, Chris? No, just thank you. And, and thanks for um, the people who uh, participated. This was great. There's so many excellent comments. Should be required viewing for everyone in education. So <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> this was absolutely fantastic, Chris. And I, I can't thank you enough for all the time that you've carved out for our organization and our community. So best to you. Oh, it yeah. Kicks off. I really appreciate it. Great. Thanks. Bye, all. Thanks for participating today. Have a great weekend.